Did you ever hear about the time Navy SEALs reportedly filmed strange creatures in Africa? Or the time a UFO crashed in Loch Ness? Or the time a UFO took out the roof of a school? I'm going to guess probably not. If you spend enough time reading paranormal literature, you will stumble across cases that are so weird and bizarre that you'll ask yourself why you've never heard of them before. Join me as I delve into these weird and bizarre cases. As reported in Lauren Coleman's website, Cryptomundo.com, in January 2006, a former U.S. Navy SEAL came forward to tell of his bizarre experience in Africa. Given the nature of his employment, Coleman was reluctant to reveal his identity, though he was actively seeking to confirm the man's story. According to the former SEAL, at the time of his experience, he was involved in covert operations in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This was between 1997 and 2002. According to him, his team observed a group of 13 chimpanzee-like creatures between four and a half and five feet tall, uniformly gray all over their bodies, with rows of seemingly porcupine-like quills running the length of their backs. The unidentified creatures walked bipedally and were observed by the team in the act of killing another animal. When the creatures became excited or agitated, the quills or spines stood erect from their bodies. According to the witness, the U.S. Navy SEAL team took three minutes of video footage of these creatures, but the tape apparently had been classified due to their mission. This SEAL member still had his operational maps and was able to pinpoint to Coleman the area of the encounter with this large group of bipedal creatures. The involvement of a U.S. Navy SEAL team would indicate their activity employed water as a means of transportation and or they were working in an area involving a lake, river, or a swamp. Coleman wondered what these strangely haired unknown apes could be. He noted that their description matched the hairy, short, upright creatures with bizarre spiked hair known to inhabit areas near certain bodies of water on specific islands. He claimed that various regional names, Chupacabra, Kappa, hid the fact that they all resembled each other in their number of digits, spiked hair, aggressiveness, and aquatic habits. Coleman also believed that it was similar to the creature known to Madagascar natives as the Colonaro, a short, three-toed, bipedal, water-dwelling, mean, scruffy-haired hominid known for abducting children, amongst other terrible things. Is this what the Navy SEAL and his team encountered and videotaped? From what I can tell, the videotape has never been made public. On August 20, 2011, a large-scale search was conducted by emergency services after witnesses reported seeing a strange object falling from the sky near the village of Dore. It was around 8 p.m. Saturday when an object described as being, quote, round, balloon-like in shape and blue in color appeared to hover over Loch Ness before eventually falling or crashing to the ground. People quickly notified authorities who promptly arrived on the scene. Officers feared that a parachutist or hang glider may have crash landed and so a large scale search was triggered. Police, Coast Guard officers, a lifeboat crew and an RAF search and rescue helicopter scoured the southern shore of the lock and an area of Dore for around three hours but found no trace of an aircraft or parachute. The search was eventually called off. Gordon Derrick of STV News wrote of the bizarre incident, which appeared in the next day's newspaper. One local resident, Denise Rooney, contacted STV, claiming that she had noticed an object in the sky while having a barbecue in the hills above Dory. I pointed out a white globe that I thought was a star initially, but it moved across the sky. It was very far away. Could have been anything and it was on a steady path. I just remember thinking I could see it but not hear it, and it was an unusual flight path from that direction. Rescue workers told STV News that they believed the alarm was raised in good faith 
and commended members of the public who called out the emergency services. Loch Ness RNLI crew member Martin Douglas noted, A member of the public reported seeing a hang glider or microlight descending into the lock. A lifeboat crew spoke to some people gathered on the shoreline who stated that they had seen a balloon-like object just above the tree line near Dore. Vivian Bailey, a colleague of Douglas, added, Speed of arrival on scene was essential, and we were able to link our search efforts with those of the Coast Guard and RAF, something we practice regularly. We believe the reports were based on sightings causing genuine concern, and we commend the actions and members of the public that contacted the emergency services. That said, what did come down in Loch Ness? It's interesting how the descriptions varied, from a microlight to a hang glider, to a blue-colored balloon-like object, to a white globe. One thing is for sure, the witnesses did apparently see something moving across the sky before eventually falling to Earth, though despite a tremendous search of the area, nothing was found. I have discussed these so-called phantom parachutes or balloons in previous videos. Almost always they are seen to fall to Earth, though a search of the crash site reveals nothing. Given Loch Ness's history of strangeness, I found this report to be interesting. In the 2013 issue of the OVNI newsletter, author and researcher Margaret Fry described a very strange thing that happened to her while visiting Barcelona in 1970. At the time, she claims that she had just joined an International Golden Correspondence Club. It was through this that Fry was introduced to Pierre Costello the chief designer of Concord. They wrote to each other quite often. Another pen pal was a man named Francisco Boulander, who lived in Barcelona. He was trying to improve his English, and Fry made an effort to assist him. In the spring of 1970, Fry decided to take a trip to Barcelona, and Ulander offered to meet her at the airport. When she arrived, it was around midnight, she discovered that Ulander had also booked her a hotel room in the city center. The room in the hotel was two floors up and had two beds with a bedside cabinet in between. Fry bid him a good night, but Ulander surprised her by stating that he would be staying at the hotel with her, at least for that night. Fry was furious at his presumptuousness, though she was also dead tired and not in the mood for a big public scene. Ulander was adamant that he had nothing but the best intentions, just that it was so late that if he were to return home, he would not get there until 3 a.m. and would probably wake his mother. Fry, who was exhausted from the flight, agreed to let him stay, but only if there was no funny business. Ulander insisted that he would keep his hands to himself. They headed up to the room and got ready for bed. Fry recalled what happened next. At this, I was so tired, as soon as my head touched the pillow, I was asleep. Maybe about an hour later, I awoke to see moonlight streaming into the room through the open curtains of the huge ground-level patio windows. There in the corner by a wash basin sat three little devils with horns. They formed a close circle and each had their heads bent, one arm linked, and the other hand over their three quarters closed large eyes. Fry claimed she immediately screamed in horror, which woke Francisco. Just then their beds began to roll violently all over the room. It was so intense that Fry worried that she or Francisco might be forcefully thrown from their beds through the plate glass windows. I managed to jump onto Francisco's bed. We were absolutely petrified as I shouted, put the lights on. This was just about impossible as the beds were zigzagging fast about the room. Finally, he managed to switch on the lights. The devils vanished and the bed stopped. Fry and Francisco immediately left the room and went down to the reception area where they spent the remainder of the evening resting in chairs. Francisco apologized, fearing that his wicked thoughts had somehow caused the devils to appear. In the early morning, Fry managed to book a room at the Barcelona WMCA. For the rest of her holiday, Francisco, who lived with his parents and worked for the electricity board, showed her the sights around Barcelona. 
He behaved like a total gentleman, and Fry grew to really enjoy his company. She found him to be a really down-to-earth, normal person. Whenever she traveled to Barcelona, Francisco would always be there to show her around. In 1972, Fry remarried. In 1973, she traveled to Barcelona again. Francisco and her had lunch together. Fry recalled that in the years since their encounter, she had begun to question it. Like maybe she had dreamt it, or maybe things didn't play out the way she remembered. She decided to ask Francisco about what he remembered about that night. Don't mention that again, please, please. It was the most horrible, horrible experience of my life, Francisco told her. He was quite upset. Fry realized that what she and Francisco had experienced that night was real, and not a dream. In the years since the incident, Fry has begun to question if the experience was actually an alien encounter, as opposed to a demon or ghostly visitation. She does not know why they were formed in a circle, hand on one shoulder, one hand covering their eyes. It's a strange pose. It's interesting the detail of the beds moving about. This almost sounds like poltergeist activity, which again we tend to attribute to spirits and ghosts, not aliens. Fry seemed to indicate that these beings were the ones causing this, but why? Were they attempting to keep Fry and Francisco occupied while they made their escape? Once the lights came on, the activity stopped and the beings vanished. What is it about the light that causes these creatures to frequently vanish? Better yet, what were they doing in Fry's room? As reported in the July 12, 1979 issue of the New Delhi Statesman, a very strange incident occurred in Islampur and West Jinnapar, in which the roof of a school and another building on campus were torn off by a strange object. It was early July 1979, 9.45 p.m. Villagers at a farming colony about two kilometers outside of Islampur watched as a strange object emitting a bright red light came down from an overcast sky from the northwest. According to the superintendent of police, the villagers thought the object was a chunk of the U.S. space station Skylab that was crashing to Earth. They immediately took cover. Strangely, the object did not crash to the ground, but rather stopped and hovered over a nearby school building. It remained there for some time before eventually moving off to the southwest. The villagers lost sight of the object as it drifted further and further away from them. The strangest aspect of this otherwise mundane sighting was that when the object departed, it took something with it. The corrugated tin sheds of the buildings, the rooftops, were sucked in by the object during its departure. A villager who had taken shelter inside the school was actually injured. The fire brigade and the police cordoned off the area. Scientists of North Bengal University were asked by the district administration to investigate the matter. I think we've all heard of UFOs tractor beaming up people and animals, but I've never heard of a UFO sucking up a roof. That's a first for me. In the summer of 1977, Daniel Wayne Sarton was hiking in the mountains in Pennsylvania with his dog Wob when he encountered something truly strange. He recalled that on that day they had been walking along through the brush when his dog suddenly bolted ahead of him out of his line of sight. Sarton claims that he then heard it barking frantically and howling and he assumed that the dog had been attacked by another animal and was most likely injured. He quickly ran up through the woods towards the sound of his dog and eventually came into a small clearing. He looked around and was dumbfounded. He could clearly hear his dog whining softly somewhere close by, but no matter where he looked, he just could not see the dog. And that is when he looked up. I know this may be hard to believe, but he was floating in the air a good 20 feet above my head. I couldn't believe it, so I called to him. He didn't make any sound. Now I didn't know what to do, so I just stared up at him, and then he slowly floated to the ground. Sarton claims that he inspected his dog and found him to be seemingly uninjured. 
He kneeled beside him and petted him, unsure of what else to do. It was then Sartan noticed that the ground seemed to be vibrating. Then he felt the sensation of something grabbing or forcing his head up, so that he was looking back at the sky. And then from nowhere, and I mean nowhere, this big cube just pops into view. It is revolving end over end, and at the same time it is spinning clockwise at a slow rate of speed. It doesn't actually move around though, just spins in the same spot. It is so bright that I have trouble looking at it at first, then I try to look away, but can't move. It was then that Sartan began to hear a deep voice coming from somewhere. The best way he could describe it was that it was being beamed down from above and bouncing off the ground to which he could hear it. The message it relayed was ominous. This voice said that Earth would soon be changed, that man was not growing properly, and that we would be cut down to make room for another superior race or crop. Soon after, Sartan noticed that he could move his head. He peered down at his dog and observed that he seemed to be asleep. He attempted to call out to him but found that he was unable to speak. Then, before my eyes, the cube just seemed to get farther and farther away without actually moving, and then it was gone. Sartan was eventually able to move again, and he gathered up his dog and retreated back to his vehicle. He returned home. Later that night his dog ran away and never returned. Sartan claims that he has gone back to that area many times since the incident. This case reminded me a lot of the Tetbury incident, in which a man received an ominous warning from a UFO which was hovering over him. A message that hinted that the visitors might be scheming to end humanity. Sadly, Sartan never disclosed any other details. It would be interesting to find out what else these beings might have told him about our possible future. <laughs>